Hey, hello everybody to this lecture on uh, turbulence simulations with um, NEC 5000. What I would like to show you during the next two hours is how we can use NEC 5000 in simulating turbulence, both for you know, uh, fundamental fluid mechanics, but also for engineering applications. Um, before I start, I would like to um, also acknowledge that um, some of the material that I'm going to show you today is actually taken from previous presentations, both by uh, Adam Popinski and Niklas Janssen from KTH. And also there is, um, there is some material that was um, previously prepared by uh, Paul Fischer from uh, Urbana in, um, in Urbana-Champagne. Um, so the, the idea with today's presentation is that I would like to start first with a short motivation, both for um, turbulence simulations in general, but then also for NEC 5000 and also explain to you what NEC 5000 actually is, a little bit about the history. Um, but then we will directly dive into uh, kind of the more detailed analysis of NEC 5000. So we will look at the, at the numerics, we will look at um, the implementations, and of course also um, why this particular type of implementation is necessary for NEC 5000 to give it um, uh, the properties that, is, that are actually necessary. Um, in the second hour, um, I would then like to go over to a, a number of selected examples where um, I will show you how we have used NEC 5000 during the last maybe 10 years uh, in simulating both external flows, mostly aer aeronautical flows, but also uh, internal flows, mostly uh, pipe flows. So let me just start with the general motiva motivation why I think turbulence and turbulence simulations in particular is actually a very, well, an important area of research and also it will not uh, disappear very soon. Um, I'd like to show you or start with this um, uh, favorite plot of mine where you can see the number of kilometers that a person does every day as a function of, uh, of the year during the last two centuries. And as you can see is that the, the accumulated distance every person does every day is essentially um, growing exponentially from um, a few hundred meters um, 200 years ago to maybe 50, 60 kilometers uh, that we do um, these days. Of course, the, the means of transportation have changed from perhaps um, mostly waterways and, and horses and so on up to kind of more technical devices, trains, cars, and airplanes. And, and of course, these three devices here, they are all related in, well, in one way or another to uh, fluid mechanics and in particular also turbulence. So for instance, the, of course, lift and drag on airplanes, internal combustion engines on cars, and um, the aerodynamics on, uh, on trains, uh, for instance. So that means our research that we do with, with um, um, on trying to, to understand and predict or model turbulence, of course, has a direct implication on, on these types of uh, at the same time, uh, there's also a very interesting quote that I, um, uh, that I found in the, in the literature um, from a paper from 1975 from NASA Ames, and essentially uh, says, well, when a sufficiently advanced computer becomes available, it will eventually replace all the wind tunnel experiments um, in, in the world. And I guess most of us, you know, focusing on simulations, believe in that, that at some point, perhaps um, all experiments or most of the, the experiments can be done in, in a computer. But I guess we all disagree a little bit on, on when this happens. And uh, interestingly enough, in this uh, paper in 1975, they were predicting that this will happen sometimes during uh, the 80s, so 10, 15 years after this uh, quotation was, um, was made. And of course, we all know that it came a little bit differently um, there was huge or tremendous even uh, progress in doing numerical simulations. So for instance, the, the first DNS of channel flow in, um, in 1987, but of course we're still far away from replacing all wind tunnel tests. So I guess that also uh, means for us doing simulations or large scale simulations that perhaps the, um, the important aspect for us is, is perhaps not to replace wind tunnel experiments, but to kind of realize uh, how can we work together with experiments? How do we agree with experiments? And what subpart of perhaps a, a larger experimental study can be done with um, simulation? Um, kind of as the last step in, in, uh, in my introduction, I'd also like to, to look a little bit at the, 
of the aeronautical flows. Um, I guess you've seen this slide uh, before. Uh, this is essentially the breakdown of, of the drag that, that you experience when you're at the cruise condition in an airplane. And you can essentially see that around 50% of the drag is related to, to friction, mostly, of course, on the fuselage and on, on the wings. But, but this, this frictional drag, in principle, could be affected or reduced by appropriately designing maybe the, the, the complete shape, but maybe also just a fine scale um, surface texture. But perhaps the more interesting aspect here is if you try to make an estimate of how long would it take with today's means of um, you know, modeling and uh, computations, how long would it actually take to simulate one second of, um, of re real flow around such an airplane? And um, I'm just um, citing here the, the, the estimate given by John Kim uh, a few years ago at the um, TSFP conference. And he was estimating with a kind of a back of the envelope uh, calculation that on a um, kind of normal supercomputer, like a big cluster, um, it would maybe take a few hundred years to calculate one second. If, on the other hand, if you come from the other side, if you would like to know how big a computer needs to be to get the result in one week. So one week calculation for simulating one second of real time. Um, it turns out that what you would need is uh, essentially a machine capable of 40 exaflow. And now we know that um, a few months ago, uh, the first exaflow machine uh, got inaugurated, which also means that actually it may not be so far away uh, that we can The last as aspect that I would like to mention when it comes to, uh, to, to my introduction is um, kind of the interaction between experiments, theory, and numerical simulations, kind of working together to, uh, to, to increase our understanding of, of the physics. Um, the main aspect here is that these three different tools of knowledge gain, uh, they've also been called the three pillars uh, of science, but the, the main aspect here is that all these different um, um, means, they also have different uncertainties or different types of errors that come. For instance, for experiments, we talk about the uh, environmental uncertainties and also human factor. Theory and modeling, of course, is related to essentially not having a good model or not having enough information. Whereas for numerical simulations, you can have everything from numerics to programming, uh, but also just to kind of not having enough uh, resolution. But the important thing here is kind of to understand how would you actually interact between these, uh, these three pillars? And I guess you've all heard the expressions validation and verifications and also confirmation. And I think it's for us as numerical scientists, it's always important that we both perform a reasonable verification of what we have implemented. So are our implement or does our implementation actually solve the correct model? But at the same time, we always need to do a proper validation. So meaning that we need to make sure that the results that we get relates to some sort of ground truth, typically coming from, a, from an expert. So that means this V and V activities are of course very important uh, uh, in our field. So what is really the problem with um, numerical simulations or simulations of turbulence? Why, why is it so difficult? Um, well, if you now focus just for the to the um, uh, incompressible Navier-Stokes equations, you know, compressible flows have a whole lot of other problems. But let's just focus on incompressible flows, um, where I have now um, written down the the governing equations, so the momentum conservation here on the first line, and the uh, mass conservation or the continuity equation on the second. So first of all, you can of course understand that we have. Um, uh, on, the, on the left side of the momentum conservation, we have uh, essentially our material derivative. On the right side, we have the pressure, the influence of the pressure and the viscous term. And at the same time, as a side constraint, we have the incompressibility, incompressibility equation. Um, the nonlinearity here comes in as part of the material derivative. And of course, the goal at the end of the day is to calculate the velocity, and the pressure as a function of time subject to boundary and initial conditions. So what is really the problem? Well, 
First of all, we need to understand that this is a PDE of second order because we have this viscous term. So we have a finite, maybe, maybe high, but still finite um, uh, Reynolds number. The, the equation is nonlinear. So that means we have a, um, we, we, we have um, uh, the possibility that the chaotic flows or chaos may, may develop, so in the form of, uh, of turbulence. And then I guess for us doing incompressible flows, maybe the main aspect is that the pressure, if I go back here, the pressure appears here only in the momentum equations, but it does not have a time derivative. So that means we cannot just do a simple time integration um, of both velocity and the pressure as we may, uh, for instance, do for, for compressible flows. No, we need to calculate the pressure with the help of the, com uh, of the um, uh, continuity equation. So essentially, equation two, continuity equation, will act as a, as a constraint to equation number one. So we need to make sure that at each time step, we somehow fulfill the continuity equation by adapting the pressure uh, in a suitable way. And of course, that leads at the end uh, to, to very annoying uh, solution schemes necessary for the Navier Stokes equation. We will talk more uh, about uh, how this is really done in practice later on. Um, but but in, in the end, this also means that, that actually the Navier Stokes equations or the set of the, the momentum and the mass conservation equations, their, um, their coupled system or uh, system of partial differential equations of different types. They have elliptic components from the pressure, they're parabolic because of the viscosity, and they have uh, hyperbolic, um, hyperbolic aspects from the um, essentially the, the material derivatives from the advection. Um, and of course, so that's that's uh, three problems, and then the fourth problem is also that we have, um, of course, generally we do not know uh, boundary conditions, inflow conditions, or outflow conditions, or even initial conditions are typically. So, in my view, these are kind of the, the four main aspects why solutions to Navier Stokes uh, are so difficult. But perhaps for us now today, uh, when also talking about Nike 5000, perhaps the, the, the main aspect is, uh, is this thing about how to calculate the pressure, so how to fulfill uh, the continuity equation. And um, it's just a kind of a, a very illustri illustrative uh, example that goes, um, that goes back to Paul Fisher, who has always used that. Um, to demonstrate the elliptic behavior of the pressure and also what it actually means for uh, performing numerical simulations. So just imagine you have a very, very long pipe, which is filled with a fluid. And um, we're, we're thinking of low Mach numbers so that we can actually do a, a model with an um, incompressible flow. And um, just imagine that you have a hammer in your hand and you, you bang here on, on one side of this pipe. Then, of course, what happens is that there will be a pressure pulse that will travel through this uh, pipe, and at some point it will uh, reach at the other end. Now, the thing is, if you talk about incompressible flow, the speed of sound, which is the speed of how this pressure pulse will, will travel, is actually infinite. So that means at the moment when I hit here, I will directly hear it here on the, on the other side. And of course, that means uh, that somehow in one time step, so instantaneously, the, the information needs to travel from the left to the right. So that means there needs to be some sort of communication happening from left to right, instantaneously. And I guess uh, just with this a very simple example, you can directly realize that there needs to be some sort of communication happening, um, even for a numerical scheme. So each point needs to talk to every other point in each time step. And I guess that's exactly the issue that that we're dealing with with um, um, incompressible flows. So on a computer, every grid point needs to talk to every other grid point at every time step. Of course, that's a very difficult um, task to perform. So let me now move on to uh, give you a very brief history of, of CFD. Also here, of course, I will not uh, go into too many details because you have uh, probably already heard about that before, but I would like to kind of focus uh, on those aspects that are most relevant to uh, also NEC 5000. I'd like to start with um, of the humble beginnings of uh, CF CFD uh, roughly 100 years ago uh, by this book um, uh, by Louis Fry um, Richardson, uh, published 1922, where he for the first time actually talked about 
you know, weather prediction by a numerical process. So by calculating solutions, not analytically, but rather numerically. And this is exactly that book where this famous poem that, that we have all heard in our uh, turbulence courses at some point about big worlds have little worlds that feed on their um, velocity, um, essentially introducing the, the turbulence uh, cascade. And in that sense, that everything is uh, self-similar in, in, in terms. But what is probably for us as uh, CFD practitioners more important um, is, is the other part when he actually starts to talk or invents um, doing simulations of, of CFD. Um, so he, he essentially um, describes what he did in 1920, where he uh, attempted an eight hour weather prediction. And it took him six weeks together with 2000 human computers to calculate um, the weather for this um, eight hour or the prediction for his eight hours. Um, and um, what he calls this, um, the way to do that was a, um, a forecast factor. And um, there is actually a, a nice painting that, that somehow uh, illustrates how uh, perhaps uh, Richardson was, was thinking about doing this uh, forecast factory at the time without the knowledge of uh, having digital uh, computers. Everything was done with human computers. But um, if you see here, that's kind of the, um, the map of the Earth. And you have um, a discretization into these um, red and white squares. Behind each of these squares is a little office where these human computers are calculating. And then you have the, the master node um, here in the center that then um, tries to do the communication between these different cells by, by the use of these uh, beams of light. So in, in, in some sense, um, Richardson has um, invented a parallel programming or parallel processing and um, the message passing via, uh, well, in this case, via beams of light, but of course uh, the, the principle of sending messages between these different cells was uh, uh, encoded. Yeah, so this was kind of the, the first step. Then the first real simulation uh, was then done in, in the 60s. Um, you can see here a picture of around 1500 grid points. This was a cylinder wake, um, which was then already done on a, on a computer. The 60s were then dominated by um, the invention of the first numerical methods for incompressible flows. I guess it, the, the two examples that I have here are exactly dealing with the problem that we introduced before of how the pressure is actually coupled to the, uh, to the velocity. And uh, these methods are quite relevant also to, to MEC 5000 because they're essentially with, with a slight modifications used uh, even today. In the 70s, it was then uh, a lot about turbulence modeling because one realized that uh, CFD can actually be used for engineering applications. So LES and RANS, and also CFD was uh, kind of invented in, in the 70s. And then, as we said before, in the 80s, things become, uh, became colorful. Uh, you, you could actually do direct numerical simulations. And for the first time, you could really see um, a turbulence. So here, for instance, for a turbulent boundary layer with all these nice vertical structures. Um, yeah, so the... the why, why is CFD and in particular also the codes like NEC 5000 so important? Well, it turns actually out that the solution of the Navier-Stokes equations on today's supercomputers are a major part of all the computer time that's being used. And uh, we made a, a, sh a short survey maybe, maybe 10 years ago, it probably hasn't changed very much um, since then, that roughly 40% of all the computer time that is being used uh, these days is actually spent in solving uh, the Navier Stokes equations in one way or another, which of course means then that um, solution methods for Navier Stokes are quite relevant when it comes to kind of general usage of the computer. So, the, the big problem for us is um, in, in fluid mechanics, is of course the, the Reynolds number. The Reynolds number determines how big or how small uh, the, the, the structures are or how large the span of, of, um, of scales is that we need to resolve both in space and, and in time. And of course, for engineering applications, um, you can see in this sketch that, that we took from Dick, um, you have the different um, aspects like airplanes, cars, and then ships or, or the atmosphere. And 
perhaps what we can resolve these days is somewhere here in terms of Reynolds numbers, Reynolds numbers on the order of you know, a few thousand um, scaled in, in the friction um, Reynolds number. And I guess you can, you can directly see here, uh, I took this, uh, these pictures from uh, some pipe simulations, the, the, the effect of Reynolds number, in this case roughly a, a, an order of magnitude, um, you can clearly see that the scales, they get smaller and smaller, even though the dynamics of the individual scales are kind of comparable between the, the highest and the, and the lowest uh, Reynolds. It's just a range of scales that has, has a difference. Now, for instance, for pipe flow, um, we're somewhere in the range, what we can do with DNS these days, of around 100,000, which corresponds to perhaps resolving the flow in oil pipelines. So large pipes, but with a very viscous flow. And also this is another uh, illustration of what happens actually when you have high Reynolds numbers. Well, in the end, you get very, very small scales close to the wall, which you then need to resolve with your um, numerical mesh. Now, the last aspect that uh, I would also like to, uh, to briefly mention before we then go into the details of MAC 5000 um, is also the interplay of the, the relative importance of the numerics, so the quality of your numerics, um, together with the, um, the influence of the, the amount of modeling that you, that you uh, have in your, uh, in your simulation. So here on the top of this uh, pyramid, we have direct numerical simulations, so that uh, that type of method or that type of simulations where you do not model anything, you just discretize and solve or time integrate Navier Stokes equations. And down here we have uh, the Reynolds average Navier Stokes equations where all the turbulence essentially is, um, is modeled. I guess the main aspect here is on the top of the pyramid, you really need to have good high accuracy numerical schemes to get good, good results because you have the least influence of the model, whereas down here, perhaps it's, um, it's acceptable to have uh, lower order numerical schemes because most of the turbulence, most of the fluctuation is anyway. Uh, now, developing CFD, me the CFD methods uh, is of course uh, not something that, that, that only we do. I mean, the whole world is, a, or the, the whole academic world is of course very much interested in getting better methods for, for CFD. And there's this excellent paper by, by Slotnik and colleagues from, from NASA that outlines what the key, uh, key develops, developments in, in CFD should be during the, the next you know, 10, 15 years. And um, they, they have a few, identified a few important aspects, both when it comes to modeling, to algorithms, to post-processing um, or uh, analysis and optimization, which um, kind of tell you what the key areas of research actually should be, ranging from you know, doing adaptive mesh refinements, for instance, um, to uh, including chemistry or um, also in including uncertainty quantification in your simulation. So if you're interested in a, in a broader perspective on that, um, it, it is a very interesting uh, read uh, indeed to, to do. With this, I would now like to go over to uh, discussing um, NEC 5000. What is actually NEC 5000 and, and what are the, the, the key aspects of, of NEC 5000? So NEC 5000 is a um, spectral element code uh, developed um, originally at the MIT by the group of, um, uh, or by, by, um, by, by Paul Fisher and, uh, and, and colleagues. And the NEC 5000 was um, uh, kind of taken as um, the high performance, um, the high performance family um, uh, from from the original Necton, um, uh, the Necton code. Um, it has become open source, and um, you, you can see here also the web address where you find all the information, also downloads for for NEC 5000. Essentially, it's a code mainly in Fortran 77, but there's also uh, some C for the IO part. And uh, as I will say later, um, it has been um, shown to be an excellent code, both when it comes to performance, but also the, the, the various types of algorithms that, that, um, that are included there. Also, um, in, in, it's not just a European, uh, it's not just an American code, also in Europe, 
there has been a number of EU projects that, that, that have been devoted to um, improving or, or working on certain aspects of MAC 5000 with um, um, three or four um, uh, European uh, projects. Now, why is NEC 5000 uh, so, so useful for us? Well, if you go back to the, the problems that we were mentioning before, what really the problems are of solving our Stokes equations, we identified the nonlinearities of turbulence, we identified uh, the incompressibility, and also the fact that you, that you, that you have viscosity, so that the, the, um, at the, the appearance of uh, thin boundary tables. At the same time, also as we discussed before, uh, we have these different approaches, DNS, LES, and RANS, to uh, tackle, uh, in particular, um, the, the, the problems uh, that I that I listed. Now, NEC 5000 is really a code that could um, address most of these um, these issues in in a good way. Uh, so, for instance, uh, the fact that you have thin boundary layers, you can do with the high order. It is very efficient, so you can deal with the fact that you have thin boundary layers and the incompressibility constraint. Um, also at the same time, it um, NEC 5000 provides you ways of doing everything from direct numerical simulations to um, resolved, scale resolved models like a large eddy simulation, but also um, RAN. Now, if you look at, um, at the, the, the various features that NEC 5000 has, I will not go through all of these, um, but, you, but you can see that it's not just solving one single thing in one, one uh, geometry. There is a lot of different aspects ranging from incompressible and low, uh, low Mach number uh, flows to MHD flows. You have conjugate heat transfer. You can do combustion. Um, you have, uh, as I said before, you have turbulence models and you have um, even overlapping meshes uh, that, you, that you can use. So there's a lot of different features. And of course, these two hours today are not long enough to go through all of them. So I really would just like to give you a first idea of what, what we can do with them. Now, as I was um, just saying it, uh, NEC 5000 really goes, goes back to, to the group of Tony Petra at, uh, um, uh, in, at, at MIT. So in, in the name or in the shape of the, of the Necton uh, code, uh, it won the Gordon Bell Prize in 1999 at that time. And interestingly enough, it was uh, called TerraScale uh, SEM algorithms. Uh, now we're talking about exascale, so essentially a, a factor of uh, 10 to the uh, 10 to the six more um, than than, uh, than TerraScale at the at the time. Um, there is of course um, a long history with NEC 5000. So when you go through the code, you you may find some kind of oldish um, sounding uh, comments. So for instance, this, this bug that, uh, that affixed to a, to a specific bug in a computer, this computer, which of course is long, um, long gone, but, um, but of course still uh, these, these things are, are part of, of the code. One question that also uh, comes up every, every once in a while is, why is actually NEC 5000 called NEC 5000? And actually turned out, it was um, just the name of an executable at the time, which was running on, um, on, on a computer like this, which was a DEC station 5000. Um, so that's a specific um, DEC uh, machine um, for which you could then compile your, your code. And then of course, if you run on DC, you would call it NEC 5000. Now I talked about the, the different um, capabilities of NEC. Here are also a few pictures from taken from the gallery of uh, NEC 5000, what we can actually do. And as you can see here, you can you have uh, nuclear uh, applications, you have astronomy, um, you have kind of basic physics, you have uh, combustion, but also some blood flow um, simulations that can all be done with NEC 5000. For us at KTH, um, we have been using NEC 5000 for the last uh, 15 years. Um, also, we have uh, applied it to a, a number of different types of, of, of flows, um, including uh, stability, uh, stability and transition. We have done wind turbines, we have done bluff bodies, fully turbulent flows, particle flows, but also some uh, more or less complicated optimization of uh, geometries. And then, of course, also some aeronautical flows, um, flow around the wing, 
um, both in, in conformal and non-conformal meshes. And it's, it's exactly these types of uh, examples that I would like to uh, talk in the second part of this, uh, this talk. Okay, so with this, I would now like to go into more details of, of the spectral element method um, as it is implemented in uh, MEC 5000. So it's not so much a general introduction to SEM, but rather specific to um, what is done in, uh, in MEC 5000. So if we just uh, take this uh, slide here as a starting point for motivating what um, the spectral ele element uh, method is, you can view it as a combination of the finite element method, where you typically would use low order elements, um, second order elements or something, which are very well suited to create uh, to uh, uh, to discretize quite complex uh, geometries like a, like a hard flow in this, uh, in this case. Then at the same time you have spectral methods, um, which are very useful for simple geometries, typically brick-like um, uh, geometries, channel flows of course, or quad flow, these type of things, where particular Chebyshev methods are of course. Um, uh, very powerful um, in, in terms of speed and, and accuracy. But of course, the flexibility is very much needed. Now, you can view the spectral element method really as a combination between these two worlds, being somewhere in, in, the, in between where you can simulate flows with kind of a modest uh, geometrical complexity. You would not want to, uh, to model two complex uh, geometries because, as you can see here, uh, you're still limited in putting together your domain as a combination of uh, hexahedrons or bricks, kind of playing Lego, if, if you wish. Um, so you cannot uh, do two complex geometries, but still you can do more than just, um, uh, just a chat. Um, so why is it actually so important that, that we perhaps do this transition from this uh, kind of low order finite elements to uh, these higher order spectral elements. Well, I guess for us, and as I will try to motivate later on as well, um, well, it's, it's essentially these, uh, these three aspects that, that make it attractive. First of all, we, we have then very fast convergence towards uh, the right solution with a limited number of grid points, which has implications both on, uh, uh, on, on the data rate but also on the on the memory that you that you need for for performing uh, these simulations. At the same time, you have much better properties when it comes to diffusion and dispersion. Diffusion means that um, you will not essentially damp out your uh, or diffuse your solution over time. Dispersion means that you have uh, good transportation properties um, over long times and long distances, which in particular for turbine flows may be actually quite uh, quite. Uh, so what does it really mean um, when we talk about fast convergence? Um, within uh, spectral methods, of course, we, we kind of talk about spectral convergence or uh, exponential convergence. Uh, I took here the example of the Kovasny flow, which is um, the, the laminar flow behind two obstacles, behind one obstacle, but here it's uh, duplicated. Um, and what I show here is the, the error of the solution as a function of the, um, the order of the, uh, the underlying approximation. And what you can see here by just going in, measuring, if you go from uh, four to uh, four to eight, um, in terms of uh, order, you can see that your error actually drops by, uh, by four orders of magnitude. So what you have here is you have essentially a straight line in a log lin plot, which is opposed to kind of what you would expect uh, for finite differences when you have a, a straight line in the log log plot. So that means for us, for a given error um, that is acceptable for my simulations, I have much less grip points. I have a smaller, or I may have much less grip points. I may have a, a smaller memory footprint, but also that's particularly relevant uh, for parallel processing. I have a much smaller communication volumes. I need to communicate um, many, or fewer, fewer grid points with each other. Another nice um, illustration of the importance of order uh, can be seen here. This is the so-called convection, convecting cone problem, 
where um, you're just looking at the convection of um, uh, of this solution, which should just should just circle around. And um, you can see here these three pictures, which are all done with the same number of degrees of freedom, but at different orders, order one, three, and eight. And you can directly see that the highest order, where you have you know, highest order, but the, the fewest number of elements, of course, um, gives you a much better uh, prediction of the solution so that the cone is not smeared out uh, uh, very quickly. Um, so how does NAC 5000 really work? Well, we said it before, we uh, distribute uh, our domain into um, a number of these elements. Each element has then a number of grid points inside. So typically it's 10 by 10, or an order 10 by 10 in 2D or 10 by 10 by 10 in, in 3D. And um, these elements then communicate over its boundaries. So that means um, in the end, we're talking about a loosely coupled system in a sense that only the boundary elements are um, communicated. This means that it's only the function value, not the derivative uh, that are continuous over the element uh, boundaries. Um, in that way, you can actually do quite, uh, quite efficient parallelization, which we'll again uh, go back, uh, come back to later on. Um, and NAC 5000 has been shown to run on millions of uh, ranks, MPI ranks. Um, I'm not uh, sure what the, um, the current kind of highest um, uh, or largest case is, but this is a picture from a few years ago on Mira, where you can see that you, that you get a, a parallel efficiency of around 0.6, um, even on um, over, the, over, the, um, over 1 million of um, ranks, which of course is, um, is uh, very nice. Um, before we go further and really go into dive into numerics, I would uh, just like to show you another way of, uh, in a quantitative way, uh, motivate why high order actually may be uh, beneficial. Um, what we show here is a, a UQ analysis when we compare the NEC 5000 and open foam for a standard uh, channel flow. What we look at is not so much the efficiency or the speed of the code, we just look at the, the results as a function of uh, grid spacing in both of these, uh, of these codes. So we fix the, the grid in Y and we vary the grid in X and Z in the wall parallel um, directions. Then we look at some standard uh, quantities that everybody's interested in channel flows. Um, so we look at the friction, the mean velocity and the RMS values. And we do a, a kind of a standard a UQ analysis um, we, we kind of look at the model response and then we can do a, a sensitivity analysis. For that. So just the, the kind of the forward UQ problem is um, we, we run the codes for, for different types of resolutions and we plot uh, the error. Of course, for plotting an error, you need to have a reference truth, um, which you typically take from, uh, from somewhere else. Um, and these are here the results, both for the friction for the mean velocity deviation and the deviation of the turbulent kinetic energy. So first of all, you can, uh, you can see that in this corner where you have the highest resolution, for, all, for both codes and all quantities, you kind of have the smallest error, or at least a small error, a smaller error than kind of further away from this, uh, this corner, which of course is good, which means that both codes are converging, which is, uh, which is of course relevant. However, you also see that not all of these um, quantities of interest actually converge um, with the same kind of shape. Um, also, what you can see if you now look at the numbers, um, for a given resolution, if you choose a specific value, you can see that NAC 5000, due to the higher order, is also more accurate than, for instance, open form or the low order, which perhaps is also um, expected because there may also be a different cost involved. But what you can now do is, with, the, with this kind of UQ framework in mind, you can actually go in and look at the robustness of your results. Um, if you now think of an engineering flow where it's not so clear what your, uh, what your resolution in plus units, so scaling with the friction, really is at every point, so you may actually have a variation of your, of your plus uh, scaled um, resolution. What we now did is we took 
kind of this region here, which is um, kind of a region which we would say, well, it's an accepted um, resolution for kind of DNS or maybe quasi DNS. And we essentially averaged the previous results over that region, saying that um, how accurate is, is our resolution if we let the, the resolution vary over this, uh, this region. And this we did with an uncertainty propagation with a polynomial chaos um, expansion for, for this, um, these quantities. And actually, it's kind of interesting what you can see here is that for Necro 1000, we have an essentially almost perfect prediction of the mean velocity. Um, there is some deviation, so some uh, confidence interval that we see for the fluctuations. Whereas for open foam, we already see quite a large fluctuation for the mean flow, uh, but then an equally larger fluctuation also for the um, uh, for for the, uh, the the turbulence, um, so the RMS values, which kind of uh, means at the end that the NEC 5000 or the high order method would be much more robust when it comes to their results when when you have a change of uh, resolution. Now, what you can also do with these results, you can do what is called a global sensitivity analysis. So you can you can then go back and try to um, analyze what of what is the determining um, influence of why you have this variation in, in your results, or why you have this fluctuation in, for instance, the mean flow or the fluctuation. And um, this we have done in the in the by by looking at the so-called Sobol indices. For instance, for NEC 5000, you can see that it's mainly the spanwise resolution that matters close to the wall, whereas um, further away from the wall, it's mainly the streamwise resolution. Um, for uh, open form, you can kind of see the same result, but you have this interesting intermediate behavior um, close to the wall, which we didn't really understand why this would, uh, would appear. Okay, now with this said, I would like to go now into the numerics of NEC 5000 and also then relate it to uh, the implementation. Now, of course, there's, there's a lot of literature available on um, how, how NEC 5000 works and um, or how spectral or spectral element methods work. Uh, I would mainly kind of focus on or mention these four or three books plus our, our kind of um, our tutorial that we that we have put together at KTH, which are um, relevant for understanding the, the numerics. I guess the main the main book would be the one by Deville uh, et al., uh, which is really focusing on exactly the numerics that are also in uh, NEC. But let's just start um, with um, what NEC 5000 is doing. Um, well, we take the example of a Poisson equation, which is uh, the standard equation on, on how to demonstrate finite element or spectral element discretizations. So we have a uh, nabla square, u is some right hand side um, with uh, some bounded conditions. Now, in the sense of weak um, solutions, um, we essentially multiply uh, everything with. Um, um, with, with V, um, and uh, then we do uh, we do a partial integration or integration by uh, by parts, um, which then gives us this uh, bilinear um, form. So that means uh, at the end we would then need to discretize this domain um, in some uh, in some appro approximation space, and then we find a solution that that uh, approximates these integrals. So that means. We need to find a certain um, basis or a space for our uh, for our uh, functions to to expand them in, so we can essentially write that our vector vector of uh, of uh, basis functions are these uh, phi's ranging from phi one to to phi, phi n, and then our solution is then written as an expansion um, of um, uh, of these base functions with a certain um, certain values for uh, coefficients in this uh, case, the size. Um, so we have talked uh, before about the uh, high order approximations and high order would of course mean in this case, when we just talk about a, a 1D representation, um, would mean that this N would, would, um, would increase. So how high can actually this N be? And if you just look at um, this, uh, this example, we have here a 1D function, which we would like to, uh, to represent with n points. And if we just take them equidistantly, 
uh, spaced over, over the domain from minus one to one, we actually will see that this in the end, an approximation here would be very, very bad, even unstable if you start to increase um, uh, the number of grid points, just be because we have um, approximated everything with equidistant grid space. This is what is called Ronius phenomenon of um, uh, which highlights problem of doing a high order polynomial um, interpolation of uh, these type of functions. So what you need to do is you actually need to, uh, you, you need to use a different type of um, approximation. So you should not just use um, equidistant distribution of your points. You should rather go into for Mac 5000 now, uh, Legendre Lagrange um, polynomials, which means that you have uh, the distribution of your points with a certain densification close to the, uh, the boundaries of the elements. In this case, this is then given by the gauss lobato Legendre um, points. And you can see here a typical mesh in, in 2D for, um, for a polynomial order of four, meaning that you have five points. And uh, in these three pictures, um, you see typical ansatz functions where we um, wrote them in that way that uh, the ansatz functions are based on the Legendre polynomial, but they're Lagrange interpolants in that sense that um, you only have one value, which is one, and all the other values at the, uh, the grid points or at the intersections of these lines are um, zero, which of course does not mean that they're zero between the points. You have this wavy shape as, uh, as, you, can, as you can see. So that means in 2D, then with a clear extension also to 3D, we would expand our, um, uh, or we write, would write the expansion of our solution, U with X and Y as being a double sum of, um, of our coefficients. In this case, now the, the Lagrange coefficients, which are the directly the function values in the points I and J times the, um, the, these polynomials or the, the interpolants in both X and Y. And this is done in 2D um, by simply extending the 1D uh, form using a tensor product. Um, and in 3D, of course, you would just add um, one, more, um, one more sum around it. And if you now look closer, you can realize that HI times HJ at the grid points I and J can be represented as, um, as one coefficient, AIJ, um, which then in the end, uh, means that you can formulate the solution to your problem, so which which was uh, well, okay, uh, which whoops, which was the uh, for instance the, the solution here um, as a linear system where you have a matrix, a system matrix A, sorry, where you have a system matrix A times U, which is then the discretized velocity or solution vectors. Um, equaling a right hand side M. So at the end, you need to create your A and then you need to um, solve the linear system. Now, how would you create or how would you uh, put together this A? Well, essentially, it, you would need to um, essentially write down your stiffness matrix in each element. So it's uh, kind of written here as AIJ with element number K. And then you would need to do a global assembly of all these smaller stiffness matrices in, into, the bigger, um, into the bigger A matrix, which is symbolically written or with pseudocode written here, that you have a loop over all elements, and then you have an internal loop over uh, the grid points within each element, where you just add up all the, all the components. Now, the next question that you could ask yourself now is, of course, you have different elements. So that means if you're not in a specific element, then your, your contribution would be zero. So what is the sparsity really of this big A matrix? So does it make sense perhaps to, uh, to actually write down that system or to, to, to really do a, a global assembly of this, uh, this matrix? And it turns out that if you have linear elements, so low order elements, maybe two points or linear uh, interpolants between uh, the two points, then you would end up with a quite sparse system. But um, for our case, if we now have these higher order elements, so we take here the example with n being four, so we have five points in each direction. Um, well, it actually uh, it turns out that, um, that we will have uh, around 
n to the four non-zeros um, in in our whole in our whole matrix. And of course, this is quite a lot of numbers that we would need to store if you would really do a, a global uh, a global assembly of everything. So that means for us using spectral um, uh, spectral elements, it would not be well. It is certainly feasible to do, but it's it's not the it's not a recommended way of, of actually uh, trying to do an assembly of the full matrix A. So that means what we should do is we should rather try to work with um, what we call the unassembled um, matrices AL, and AL would then be the element-wise um, matrices where we have the, the A matrices, so the, the, uh, the matrices belonging to each um, matrix independently and after each other, and equally so, we will then have the, the solution vectors, um, the solution vector on the um, in, in the same unassembled um, way. So that of course means that because everything is uh, element-wise, we also have those points that are actually shared between two elements. They're duplicated um, in in both the A matrix and also in the solution matrix U L. So all the shared points they appear uh, twice. But now the question is, is this a problem for us? Well, actually it turns out it may not be a problem because we, we don't even need to form this, uh, this AL matrix. We just, what we just need to do is the, uh, we need to provide the action of this UL matrix, of the uh, AL matrix on a solution vector. So that means we can internally, we can take care of uh, these, uh, these uh, duplicated or replicated um, um, entries into the matrix. Now, um, here it says, why is this um, like this? Well, we'll see later. We're typically going to use a Krylov uh, method where it's really just A times U as the result that, that, that is going to be done. Well, can we now really compute uh, this AL matrix as a full matrix? Um, can we store that in memory? Do we really want to calculate it as a full matrix? Well, I guess also there is the question, do we, do we really need it or is it, is it necessary for us to, to actually um, calculate? Well, it turns out it's not. Um, it turns out that for us and also for NEC 5000, we can uh, do all our calculations in a matrix-free um, way. So we don't even need to calculate these uh, AL individual matrices. We really just do uh, calculate the actions of what this matrix would do um, for uh, on, onto our solution vectors. Now, in order to, to understand that a little bit better on, on how this is thought, um, we have to go back to our um, kind of the original definition of, um, of how our stiffness matrix would look like. So it's the integral over the element of, um, uh, of, of nabla u, nabla v, um, yeah, integrated over the element. And um, of course, the first step is um, we need to integrate, uh, we need to evaluate this integrate, integral in some way. And this we do based on our, um, on our uh, uh, gauss lobach relation order points. We do that with a Gaussian quadrature. Now, here we need to say that we're actually uh, using a mass matrix to uh, to do this um, integration, um, and there is some mass lumping involved, so we're kind of making or forcing this um, uh, this uh, uh, the mass matrix to be diagonal, which of course has a lot of uh, advantages later. <coughs> the basis functions are, as discussed before, they're tensor products of um, of the um, polynomials in the two in the spatial directions. Which then also means that we can actually, by just using um, by using the chain rule, uh, we can we can then calculate partial derivatives, which you will need for um, for the integrands. We can essentially use or uh, use derivatives of uh, the the ansatz functions um, h, in this case written as h p, um, with the uh, where p is. Uh, um, is the polynomial order and r is different or psi i is the different directions in which we want to calculate those. And now you can realize that this derivative here, 
can be written as a um, matrix vector uh, operation for, for, one, uh, for one vector, but because we do it for the whole element, we can actually write it as a matrix matrix um, multiplication. So that means this operation that we need to do is actually a small matrix matrix multiplication, which in MAC 5000 would be done um, with repeated calls to the MXM um, routines, which are exactly those routines that perform these small matrix uh, matrix multiplications. So that means then also that we can actually uh, pre-compute these um, D matrices in each direction. And these are just small matrices that, perform, that provide you the derivative um, in, in each uh, direction. Now, the next question is, do we actually need to have different derivative matrices in different directions? Well, it actually, um, it turns out that this is, this is not really necessary. It's always the same matrix um, that turns out. Uh, that, 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 that is needed um, because if you do a, um, a mapping first of your deformed geometry on what we call a, call a reference or, or mother element, we can then uh, do the same derivatives matrices in all directions. In this case, uh, these are called the S and the R uh, directions. So that means uh, we need to have some sort of Geometrical, um, geometrical deformation that we can do to go from the parent element into our deformed elements that we have in the, in the actual calculation. And for that, we typically use um, an isoparametric um, uh, geometry, um, which means we use the same ten tensor product basis um, for doing this, uh, this mapping as we have for, for the solution. So we can again write it essentially as a multiplication of um, some coefficients times the hi and hj uh, polynomials as we have uh, before. And then the partial derivatives can just be calculated using the chain rule. So for instance, here, if you wanna have du dxk, um, I essentially have d, du dri, which is then the, um, the, the coordinate direction in the parent element times um, using the chain rule dri dxk which is then the, the, the mapping from the parent element into the deformed geometry. So that means then that I can actually group together all these geometry factors. So the, you can see this is only the geometry, this, the solution does not go into that. And we can write matrices with those, which in NEC 5000 are called the GIJ uh, matrices. So whenever you have something with G, <coughs> that would then um, refer to a geometry factor. So that means in this way, we can also handle uh, geometries in the same tensor product way that we have seen that is so important for, um, for, the, um, for the representation of the, uh, or for the speed of the, of the calculation. Now there's of course some limitations that you need to, um, that you need to fulfill when, when doing, um, when, 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 when doing these affine uh, or linear transformations, um, for instance, you should make sure that your angles uh, between two sides are not too large and not too low. Um, and you should also try to obey, avoid um, high aspect ratio sets if that's uh, possible. This will be uh, bad for your um, iteration count when you do then the iterative um, solutions. Um, this is one, one uh, illustration where, um, where we look at the high aspect ratio cells. So for instance, if it turns out that in this element nine here, you would have something that you need to resolve with more elements. Um, you would then, if you do this um, refinement, you would of course have these rays of uh, refinement um, going, going, uh, going out in kind of a, a cross-like uh, shape. And of course, these elements here would now be very, very high aspect ratio cells, which are not so good from a, uh, from a, from a computational point of view. Okay, so now I guess we have uh, um, more or less all the ingredients ready for um, writing down our uh, our final system. So we have here, so we're back at the at the bilinear bilinear form, which we have now understood that um, we can actually use derivatives in the R and the S directions. 
for our V um, elemental solution. Then we have the geometry factor, and then we have the, deriv the derivatives for the for the U vector. Um, and we can we can now see that we can even take uh, the R and the S out and essentially group everything as a as a matrix um, here in the in the middle between the two velocity um, vectors. So that means now that uh, really at the end that the entire bilinear form for the Poisson equation um, can be written in, in this particular way, where we uh, where we have a, um, an elemental matrix A E for each element. We have here again the sum over all over all the elements, um, where we have the two um, velocities on both uh, both sides. So we we essentially can hit this um, this matrix in the middle with these two uh, vectors from uh, from the sum. Um, yeah, so what have we done so far? Well, we have used um, gauss lobato legendre quadrature to evaluate the integrals. Um, we have used the chain rules to uh, take into account the, uh, the geometry factors. And, and one more um, important aspect that I have not mentioned yet, but, um, but is crucial for the, the, the efficiency or the speed of, of these calculations is that um, all these derivative matrices, they can actually uh, also exploit the fact that we're using a tensor product basis. So that means that the iteration count to, uh, to computing all of this is actually not order n to the six, but rather only n to the four, if you can write um, your, derivat your derivatives matrices as these tensor uh, products. Um, the geometry factors, some of them are, are diagonal, so you don't have a lot of memory access. And in the end, what is really causing your, your work are these matrix matrix um, uh, products that you need to perform. And these are kind of smaller, smallish kernels that you, that you can optimize. And in particular, they're very, very nicely already available in, in you know, previous architecture, but also in, in modern architectures when you, when you think of uh, tensor cores on, uh, on modern um, uh, processors or GPUs. Now, the last thing, or perhaps second last thing that we need to discuss before we, we can actually do some simulations uh, is uh, the fact that we have so far not really talked about how to make sure that, um, that we can talk between two elements with each other. Because we mentioned before that we have a number of points that are actually duplicated in our big, uh, in our big unassembled matrix. So somehow we need to make sure that these duplications is also taken care of um, on a discrete level. Um, so that means we somehow need to perform what is called a, a gather and a scatter mate, uh, operation, or gather scatter matrix. Meaning that in the gather process, um, I would uh, essentially collect all the data from the duplicates and in this, um, and making sure that they're the same. In the scatter process, I would uh, kind of recommunicate um, uh, those again. These are called uh, QT and Q. And you can view us those as a Boolean uh, matrix or matrix with zeros and ones, um, where essentially you just make sure that you have to pos position the ones at the right place so that if you do the gather, you would essentially add the duplicates up. If you do scatter, you would kind of look at the transpose of that. You would kind of um, communicate it um, back. So that means if you now uh, want to do a, a mapping from local uh, to global, um, so you can use this uh, Q and uh, or QT and, and Q matrix. So for instance, in, in this particular case, um, if you have only available uh, kind of the unassembled matrix, um, you, would, uh, you would essentially um, have a Q around it, which is the, 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 the scatter operation. And then because you have the V um, here in the, in the transpose, you would then uh, essentially do the combination of uh, Q and uh, QT. So in the end, you can, you can see that just knowing the AL, so the unassembled matrix plus Q and QT, um, you see that the effect in the end is the same as if you would use the assembled um, matrix A. Now, of course, also here you can wonder whether it is Q or this QT um, is actually formed as a, as a real matrix? And the answer is no, it's not needed because um, what you need in the code is always Q 
directly followed by QT. So you always have a scatter and the gather uh, together. So you always, I mean, if, if you read it from, uh, from the right, you would always do a gather first. So for, you go from your, um, your distributed matrices, um, you, you go together, and then you directly scatter the data again. Um, so that means you will never actually need Q or QT, you just need Q and QT together. So this is a combined gather scatter operation, which is um, also available in, implemented in, in, in the code. And here you have here an example of some, uh, some pseudo code that kind of shows how this, um, how this would be done if you want to go from U to UL or from UL um, to U. Um, Another important aspect that is uh, maybe not mentioned all the time when, when talking about um, the, the uh, kind of the benefits of, of, of spectral element methods as compared to, for instance, uh, finite difference uh, methods is the fact that because we only require uh, C0 continuity over the elements, um, we actually do not have a lot of ghost points or halo points around you know, whatever each processor um, owns. It's just one point, uh, so the surface that is actually uh, that needs to interface with another process. And that is independent of the order. So what we can say kind of in the more technical terms, we only have a unit depth stencil irrespective of the polynomial. Of course, this is very good from a computational point of view. There may be some, of course, some, some drawbacks when it comes to the, the continuity of, um, of, um, of derivatives. Um, but still, this is this is an important uh, aspect. Okay, so now we have seen that that um, or we have discussed the way that, that it's implemented in Mac 5000, and then we have also seen that at the at the very end we just need to um, solve a linear system, and um, so that means we need to have efficient ways of uh, calculating um, linear systems, and and what we do is um, we we need to use some methods that only require the action of uh, the element matrix AL onto uh, the local solution vector. So we don't want to um, do any matrix operations because as we just discussed before, we actually never build uh, the matrix. So therefore we, we typically use uh, Krylov methods um, such as uh, CG or, or, or GMRES. So here you see an example for, uh, for I guess, uh, GMRES where you can see that whenever uh, we need to, uh, to, to evaluate something, we always have um, the evaluation, evaluation of AL times PL, for instance, here. So it's not that we do anything with the matrix, so it's always the matrix applied um, to something. And then you have also here the QQT operation for the gather scatter to make sure that each processor is actually doing the same um, evaluation. Um, well, then of course we also have some uh, some sort of uh, coarse grid uh, uh, solution, um, which can be done either with a direct solver XXT, which is um, a Cholesky uh, transform uh, or decomposition, or we can also do some AMG, uh, which can be done, for instance, using hyper, so that we don't need to do ourselves. Um, one additional aspect which we're not going to discuss here is that in order to um, to um, improve the convergence of the iterative solvers here, we can also use uh, projections in time. Uh, essentially, the idea here is that you realize that not all the solution vectors will change um, a lot uh, while you time integrate. So that means if you already have a good idea of what the solution will be from previous time steps, you can essentially project out these solutions and only look at the at the changes. That, that, that you will do. In this case, in this way, you can actually reduce the, the number of iterations quite uh, considerably. Um, well, time stepping, of course, is done in, in Navier Stokes. Uh, that's that's um, uh, indicated here with this uh, DDT. And as we discussed before, the issue is that we somehow need to deal with the pressure. So that means that the, the, the continuity equation is fulfilled at each time step. Um, now, the, the general time integration is done in such a way that nonlinear terms, so the convection term here is treated explicitly with a kth order extrapolation scheme, typically third order, and the linear terms, essentially the rest, um, is done in an implicit way, um, particularly the viscous term here, 
just to avoid this um, string and the time step limitation that we may have if we have, uh, uh, if we have second derivatives. So that means that um, we will end up with um, uh, Helmholtz problems. We have uh, three Helmholtz problems for the velocity. So Helmholtz problem here means that we have the second derivative from the implicit treatment of the, um, of the, um, uh, of, of, of the velocity. And then we have the, the explicit part here from the, uh, from the nonlinear term. Um, and this can be done with a um, you know, simple uh, Jacobi preconditioned uh, conjugate gradient iteration. And then we have this nasty uh, pressure equation for the uh, Poisson equation for the pressure that we need to solve at each time step. And um, uh, this, the, there in particular, the preconditioners are, are uh, very important. Uh, so also this is a, a implementation, this is uh, done in, in quite a, a, a unified way where we have an H to the Helmholtz operator, which is essentially written as H1 times A, which is the stiffness, and H2 times B, which is uh, the mass matrix. So the second derivative is here and uh, the zero derivative uh, is here. And that means both the, the Helmholtz operation for the velocity uh, and the Helmholtz operation for the pressure can be uh, written in the same way. Um, for the velocity, you would then of course, um, essentially have one over Reynolds here as the prefactor for the Laplacian, or for the, for the stiffness, and um, essentially the time step, um, the inverse time step in front of the B. Whereas for the pressure, you would, not, would have nothing for uh, the, the mass matrix, um, but you would have a, a one here for the, for the Laplace. Um, well, then there's uh, two, two additional aspects that I would like to, uh, or that, that we need to uh, discuss very briefly. We also need to have some stabilization um, in, the, in our integration. Uh, it's two types of stabilization we do. We have, um, we have a, a filtering, which is applied on the, on the highest, um, highest orders of the uh, polynomial expansion, something in, in this way, where we essentially apply a high pass filter um, multiplied with a, with a coefficient. And then we also apply de-aliasing or over-integration as it's called for um, for polynomials. Um, there the idea is that we evaluate the, the nonlinear terms not on a mesh that is n by n, or n by n by n in 3D, but rather n by n by n, where n is typically one and a half times n. So we, we essentially allow uh, more degrees of freedom for the evalu evaluation of the, of the nonlinear term. And in this way, we can ensure that the, the convection operator is Q symmetric and thereby it, uh, it, it remains uh, stable in the integration. With this, I would actually like to uh, stop with um, uh, my, my first part um, of, of the presentation, uh, which was about the, uh, the, the numerics of, of NEC 5000. Um, and then in the second part of this, uh, this presentation, we will now look at some um, examples um, how to use 